session is about looking at how NDR can the and the digital infrastructure of NDR can enable different aspects within skilling and livelihoods also. Besides, uh, we'll speak a little bit about what it has already enabled in the context of education. So, what is NDR? Uh, I think I'll start with that. Uh, NDR is the National Digital Education Architecture, but uh, the genesis of it is in terms of looking at how there can be a unifying digital infrastructure which can come into shape so that uh, it can pro energize and catalyze the ecosystem to drive different kinds of innovations in the context of education and skilling. Now why so? Uh, as we all know, India is large, diverse, complex. And it needs uh, a variety of solutions to cater to diverse scenarios right through the strata of the country and the diversity of the country. Uh, a lot of us keep building our own solutions uh, and that brings in also redundancies in terms of what we may be doing. So how you create a unifying national digital infrastructure which everyone can leverage so that it can accelerate a lot of diverse solutions which may be relevant in the context of solving different types of problems. Uh, now, NDR is not a platform. It is not a solution on its own. It is actually an architectural blueprint and a technology framework which uh, uh, has different categories of building blocks. There are 12 categories of building blocks with 36 types of building blocks. Building blocks being, uh, you know, the uh, the basic version of the uh, things which on, on top of which you can create solutions which uh, leveraging this national digital infrastructure which enable many diverse use cases and scenarios and pretty much uh, most of the relevant scenarios and hence the building blocks in that context are a part of the 12 categories and the different types of uh, building blocks that come in that context. So so that's a little bit about uh, uh, the genesis of India. Now the uh, NDR, by the way, was launched last year on 29th July on the first anniversary of uh, NEP 2020. And uh, the Honorable Prime Minister himself launched it. And I think uh, he's the one who gave a very simple articulation and a definition of NDR, which uh, most of us can understand, which is like how UPI is an ecosystem connector. NDR, uh, he called it a super connector of capabilities in the ecosystem. Why so? Because when we look at the uh, diversity and the complexity of what we are dealing with, then there are many, many capabilities that come through in that context. And different players in the ecosystem are bringing them together. So how those different capabilities can come together and be super connected so that everyone can leverage and contribute and hence create this national digital unifying infrastructure. So that's uh, essentially the crux of what NDR is. Now, I'll speak a little bit about the example of you know how uh, it has kind of already uh, taken off and uh, re relatively taking a good amount of shape in education already over the last one year, the kind of journey that it has seen. Uh, so you have the private players, the societal players, and the governments who look at uh, different types of solutions and capabilities to enable diverse use cases. For example, training of teachers. How do you make sure that uh, everyone has access to quality learning? Looking at things like, you know, how can volunteering happen? And so on and so forth. There are many different types of use cases. Uh, we already see a lot of ecosystem players uh, across uh, governments, private and societal coming together to leverage and contribute capabilities which everyone can use uh, so that, uh, you know, everyone benefits from it and and that's what is mentioned at the bottom to say that you know that's the essence of it that how you leverage and contribute content capabilities building blocks to create that national digital unifying infrastructure which everyone can uh, make use of the, in the next slide this kind of uh, shows that how this in the context of education has already started becoming quite dense so when i speak about uh, diverse use cases you can see a whole host of use cases coming through, right? You can see the list of the different types of use cases coming through in the context of uh, what the private ecosystem is bringing in or working upon. Likewise, the different uh, societal players and the governments in terms of what they are doing. I'll take an example of one from each of them just to uh, highlight the point. So like uh, digital report cards, 
which basically fidgetize the typical report card and can be generated with much higher frequency than the typical annual report card that you receive because in schools you do assessments not just once a year but many times a year. So how you create digital report cards which give visibility to progress of a child to the parent to many different stakeholders is something that Uttar Pradesh is working upon and they're also making it digitally verifiable so that tomorrow you know you cannot fake it and that is a contribution that Uttar Pradesh is looking to make in the context of India so that any other state in the country can leverage that and they don't have to build that same system and capability from scratch. Likewise, uh, when you look at from a societal player perspective, volunteering as a capability, right? So we need, uh, we may need volunteers for different types of aspects. You may need volunteers in terms of content that can come through because not, uh, there are many in the country who actually create good quality content. So how many can contribute content which can come through which if uh, kind of curated can gives you, uh, you know, diverse good quality content without some organizations making that effort. So how do you collate the effort of different organizations through volunteering capability so that everyone can benefit from it? That's one example of volunteering. Like, likewise, people can volunteer time. People can volunteer infrastructure that they have, right? So if you have a mobile phone that you would like to contribute, that's another type of volunteering. So that is a capability which allows solutions in the context of volunteering so that many types of volunteering efforts across the country can take shape without everyone trying to build that solution again and again and again uh, is the aspect coming through. And as I say that it's not a polished finished solution which one is talking about, right? Because the solutions can be reference solutions or a level below which is certain digital building blocks which allow somebody to create their own fine-tuned version of the solution depending on that particular use case or scenario and so on and so forth. So that's a societal player example. Likewise, on the private player side, uh, I think all of us as children, we know that while studying, we have a lot of doubts, right? Uh, and uh, the typical thing is to ask the teacher or ask the parent or ask the friend and so on and so forth. But how do you ask your doubts anytime in a way that it can, you know, you can get the answer within seconds? depending on whatever you're studying. And that is the capability that one of the private players would like to offer for free for anyone to benefit in the nation, right? So there are examples like these. This is just the current picture in terms of what's coming through. As we, you know, with the time, in the time to come, we do expect to be, uh, this to become more and more dense in terms of what it is. So that's how it is taking shape already in terms of education. And it has also begun to evolve in the context of uh, Skilling and livelihoods. And in fact, there are a few key capabilities that are coming through around which uh, the evolution is happening. Uh, so at the bottom, you see learning and multi language. All of us know when it comes to skilling, uh, there are different types of uh, uh, you know, uh, courses that one needs to make. They can be short duration courses, long duration courses. You need language translation capabilities so that the same course can actually be made accessible versus recreating that course in diverse languages. Right, so those kind of cap capabilities. Likewise, now when a, a student has taken a course in the context of skilling, how do you get a credential, a verifiable credential, which uh, confirms that you've taken that course? Or same thing being done in the context of any work that you may have done, or uh, uh, any reputation that you may have gained while working at something because of which you are now considered to be more skilled at. So that kind of a thing coupled with you being able to store that verifiable credential in a locker or a wallet, again, diverse type of solutions, but ultimately also generating a portfolio, which if made visible and let's say plugged into uh, diverse platforms can open up opportunities for you. Opportunities in the form of, you know, different uh, types of jobs you can take, the different types of skilling courses you can take, the different types of trainings you can take and so on and so forth. Why? Because you have credentials which have helped create a portfolio which is stored somewhere and hence that can be plugged into different platforms which offer different opportunities. And vice versa, which is for someone who's um, actually offering that skill or offering that training or offering that job can eat seamlessly discover uh, such people. And when that happens, how with open data policy, a lot of this data can be opened up for observability by the entire ecosystem. Right, because uh, I think all of us know that uh, in the country, it's all about everyone coming together to solve for diverse scenarios, use cases, complexity, 
versus you know somebody trying to do it on their own and in that context observability as a way to see the visibility of progress on different dimensions through open data under the right framework and the policy becomes an important aspect to come through right so these are some of the capabilities that are already coming up in the context of diverse use cases around scaling and livelihoods that are already taking shape in the context of india uh i just exemplify that uh, you know uh, in terms of what i spoke of uh, just a while back uh, so again there are these different types of capabilities now we simply look at it from the perspective of uh, somebody who's a job provider a skilling provider and so on and so on one side and on the other side you have the seeker who's looking for a job looking for a training looking for a skill uh, skill now what happens today uh, ultimately if the transaction happens we are talking about the flow of value the flow of value being uh, somebody being able to find the relevant thing and somebody being able to offer the relevant thing to the relevant people that they are looking for that's the flow of value right but today it gets captured in a few platforms right but how do you make sure that different platforms also get connected through open protocols i'll take a simple example all of us use emails right uh, imagine if uh, one were to tell us that if i have gmail then you can see my email only if you are also on gmail and not because you are on outlook that will be a big problem right now how was that solved in that context there were open protocols like http that got defined at that point of time which enabled cross platforms to talk to each other and hence ultimately benefit both the beneficiaries as well as the service providers so same thinking here how connector open protocols which bring in the exchange or the flow of value in a seamless way across diverse platforms uh, can be enabled by leveraging and looking at these capabilities and uh, also the move from typical archaic hiring practices of course we know you know what the typical system is to a scenario where uh, when i learn upskill myself train myself how do i get a verifiable credential in that context which is easily stored uh, somewhere in a digital wallet or a locker you know again diverse type of solutions and uh, that ultimately generates a portfolio and that portfolio if through open pro protocols is plugged into me discovering opportunities in a, opens up the whole world for me right and and for, uh, if you look at it from the other side now companies can also easily discover people right because it's not just people restricted to who uh, those who are, i have on my platform but i can discover across platforms right and i can with the consent of the user uh, verify in a single click what are the different capabilities that they have what they are claiming is the right thing or the wrong thing especially in this sector as we know that uh, uh, you know what people claim may not be correct and you have to hence verify but how you enable not just discovery but something like a single click verification down the line right and if that happens then again through observability and using the right open data policy a lot of these things can become visible to the relevant ecosystem players in the right way so that many many can come together and join the uh, uh, join the party to evolve this world right because ultimately we are, you know these are capabilities these are digital building blocks these are protocols uh, that we are talking about in this context the right solutions the right way to manifest them in the diverse scenarios i think that's where e ecosystem has a role to play besides leveraging and contributing these building blocks uh, and the solution capabilities as well and in that context uh, we already have a couple of communities that are actively engaging around the discovery and the open protocols for the sake of discovery or trainings job scaling opportunities etc etc including scholarships and uh, on the other side for how verifiable credentials the standards and the specs for that can be defined in a way looking at the worldwide standard so that the credentialing doesn't just work in india tomorrow it can work globally also and so so there are many uh, uh, organizations and individuals who are active part of these communities trying to shape that so that it becomes a part of the national digital infrastructure that the country offers so that's where i'll stop by the way there are some connects of my colleagues uh, from uh, again you see a network there because it's not just one organization people from diverse organizations are uh, moderating these communities at the moment so please feel free to engage uh, and uh, you know help expand this even further uh, so with that i will uh, you know uh, this basically highlights uh, what ndr is 
what what's the journey in terms of what it has taken of course it's a short capsule there's a lot that one can talk about but uh, how it's also shaping up in skilling and livelihoods so i'll now go back to my panel and uh get going in that one gayatri ji i think uh, you know given your uh, rich experience in the context of labor net especially working with uh, diverse uh, stakeholders on the ground and seeing the problems uh, from their perspective uh, what do you think uh, something like ndr and a national unifying digital infrastructure approach can enable uh, uh, for people on the ground I mean, what what are your thoughts around that so i think you set the context you already have the answer so i have the pleasure of uh, giving the cheat sheet you know i can just copy from there See, I think the key problem uh, which exists really is uh, uh, credentialing itself. After the formal education credentialing, what certificate is of value? So you know, uh, let's take twenty years back. It was the uh, you know short term training really came into life uh, as a as as a form of training, other than the ITI and the polytechnic training which is there but i think uh, uh, if i look at the waterfall between polytechnic iti and uh, short term training the key issue has always been the value of it so the intrinsic value how do you measure is it the value of the certificate or the value of the skill set and how do you prove it so if i look at this one of the thoughts that uh, i think possibly one could look at is there's a requirement for a lot of display because most of the skill sets which are skill based involve either dexterity or involve uh, communication uh, frontline is a combination of dexterity and communication so i think the ability to display that is very very important and uh, uh, most of our credentialing is certificate based rather than that so the opening up of that uh, as an assessment standard would be very very important the second is um, given today uh, there is such a fast pace in change in products and processes lifelong learning has become essential we all say that but one does not know really how to capture it and why should somebody come back so uh, if i go back to sectors i am familiar with uh, you know for example if you take an auto service technician uh, somebody who was doing a, a, a fiat or an ambassador to a maruti was a huge change uh, to now when ev vehicles are coming in bs6 uh, is coming is a huge change so every person there will have to the educational qualification will change numeracy digital literacy plus the uh, ability to actually capture dexterity will be very very important phlebotomist we've all come out of a miserable uh, pandemic you know Uh, i wouldn't want everything to be done simulated so i would want some real experiences but how do you really capture these uh, skill sets you know how many times you want to be pricked on the hand before your blood uh, comes out right these are skill sets which require to do so to me endure uh, of is the opportunity for us to actually house it in one location and then pick it out of that locker whenever you want uh, uh, the the key between education and livelihood is key and it is not an either or today it is an either or right you either go education or skills and i'll just take a small example uh, you know the last few days i've been in punjab i uh, visiting the schools and iti's out there and uh, you know said gayatri madam i hai sare ba ke bacche vocational ke bacche saath aa jao medical jo ja rahe hai separate jao so that but is medical not skilling how many will go for uh, there is you know the 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 thing is a very clean divide how do we break these divides uh, and therefore even for the child who goes into education is skill important nep says so nep says by 2030 we need to integrate in that case apprenticeship we these are all uh, words we are all familiar with but how do i capture learning in apprenticeship how do i capture work in apprenticeship how do i ensure for this person this is the passport the person carries for life i think that is the opportunity to me endear offers and if all of us are able to come back and place it there comfortably without losing identity 
most of us fear any public infrastructure because there is a fear that will i lose my identity so which players whether it is state or non state today if i look at education and skilling i think most of it the good thing is that acceptance for operational efficiency digital infrastructure uh, has been adopted everywhere irrespective of whether it's not for for profit for profit in a much better way um in uh, in state infrastructure etc but i think to move that to focus on me as a person um uh, you know if i am uh, gurpreet kaur what does it mean for me it is not for prati who the monitor for gurpreet kaur i think that's the difference that we need to bring in our uh, uh, thought process and i think that's the possibility that i see here thank you uh, well said gayatri ji in fact uh, you know this aspect that you spoke of that today uh, in a way there's a need to break the silos that exists uh, the mindsets around that as well as uh, at the same time the aspect of access to digital infrastructure has started shaping up right uh, of course there are certain things which can uh, which still need to happen in that context so making coming to you uh, looking at uh, uh you know diverse use cases uh, that can pan out in the context of skilling and livelihoods where access to this digital infrastructure can really enable them and help uh, resolve some of the challenges that exist today uh, your thoughts on that thank you uh actually before i before i answer your question i just want to share how excited i am about what i see happening in the space uh, i i think as a country to see upi become what it has and hence for us as a country to be a leader in public goods technology um and upi is only the first <clears throat> i think last few days we saw account aggregation uh, take leaps and bounds and uh, get and as sharad says it took 5 years to get to where we have gotten today but the whole idea of uh, public goods infra uh, using technology can be extremely powerful i was just traveling with my american friend who has a hand written vaccine certificate right uh, compared to when i was entering singapore like hey here you scan this qr code you are able to verify it that hand written vaccine certificate like can be forged in so many different ways and i'm sure it is right so in a country where we have this infrastructure where we've done this to not make progress especially around skilling and around uh, work and work in technology seems seems uh, weird but i'm glad that we are finally making progress on it to like specific use cases uh, where this can be very powerful um, the previous panel had abiraj of urban company and josh talks uh, supriya both of whom where i am an angel investor and where in both of those cases they have had to build platforms internally to manage hey how as in how adept is someone at a skill now this this money that is spent privately if it were available as a public good as a public technology that money would not have to be spent by both of these private companies right they can build further uh, so you can build infrastructure once and it can be leveraged by multiple companies uh, on top of them and you're building for future and maybe more deeper use cases rather than having to solve the same problem again and again in every company right so there are a bunch of common problems and ndr does a fantastic job of the 12 various areas where there are common challenges which if once built as platforms can be reused again and again um, especially the registry pieces i think the what i find most beautiful uh, about the ndr architecture is that very often when we talk about certifications we tend to gravitate towards a central authority right or oh, somebody should be able to tell us that hey this person is really good uh, and if you think about it that's not how the best systems that work actually work uh, so it's not it's not any any central authority saying that an iit khadakpur computer science engineer is better than say a bits pilani computer science engineer or a sit tumkur computer science engineer it is the market that tells you that right and trusting the market 
uh, with that. So all of them issue equivalent degrees, uh, right? And I think that is, as in that's the uh, that's the logic behind India that hey anybody can issue verifiable credentials, which then the market can decide hey who's more valuable instead of a central authority taking the call. It's like going back to license Raj and saying that oh somebody centrally will decide which phone Indians should buy. Right? And only that phone should be allowed to be in India versus, hey, as in you meet the basic requirements, everybody sells phones and then the market decides which phone is better. Uh, so I think that being a core principle or a core parameter of uh, India and, and I'm specifically mentioning this because when designing such systems, it's very easy to overlook this and fall for centralization uh, and it's extremely dangerous. So, so this federated model and this principle of let the market decide, let the user decide, provide agency to the user, I think that's extremely important and that's what makes me super happy about the way India is getting built out. Uh, thanks, Mekin, and thanks for uh, actually bringing out this perspective of how agency, uh, you know, is an important aspect. Uh, reuse of what someone has done uh, versus trying to build it again and again uh, an important thing uh, and how uh, it's not always about uh, authority but uh, about uh, things being uh, seen from the perspective of demand from the perspective of people who are making use of it and hence uh, how things can pan out. Now uh, uh, taking this from you to now Prachi, uh, looking at it from a funder's perspective and especially you know uh, you know that there is always uh, this tussle in terms of uh, you know what's the right thing to do what can we go after the heart is here but the mind is there uh, right so so when you especially look at it from a funder perspective what do you think this enables does it allow any flexibility for the funders to engage the uh, you know set of people that you fund and uh, you know uh, enable them further there's no question about it, Gaurav. I think both Gaurav's have explained India to me multiple times and I just, every time I listen through it and including, you know, your very powerful presentation today, I just think that all the components which should be there in order to empower and enable both the education and the skilling ecosystem are already there. So there is no question, I think, of heart and mind over here in terms of uh, the need for it and the uh, I would say the sophistication and the design of it. I really think, you know, how should we expedite the journey such that more and more of the partners uh, engage with it? I mean, the panel that uh, Nikhil is also talking about, one of the things, you know, which kept coming out of this panel is about our resume and our worker history, right? Which is just getting left behind in all of these different panels, uh, all of these different platforms and places where you work, which is probably the single biggest friction which is there in uh, employment matching today. I don't have anything beyond that one vocational certificate I got 30 years ago. I still rely on, you know, a word of mouth, a reference, which may or may not come. So, so I think the importance of what you are doing and the, you know, the impact that it can have is immense just by that single, you know, digital certificate. Uh, where if uh, employ uh, your experience certificate that uh, that can be unlocked, and uh, and there is a there is there has to be a way in which the ecosystem engages in this and expedites this journey because we are today facing like our biggest uh, unemployment crisis, not just uh, from an employment perspective but also from an employability perspective. So I think both. Uh, skilling and the quality of those skills is a challenge but at the same time uh, you know those of us who are out there with the relevant skills and are not getting matched to appropriate opportunities is just as as big a challenge so um, so no I actually don't think that there is any question of uh, whether this is relevant for any of us who are working uh, in the skilling system this is actually a huge step forward uh, but we just have to come up with some very concrete ideas or maybe even sandboxes as you have thought in the context of education where you know we can engage so for example all of these platforms is there anything that we can do cross-cutting where they are at least willing to share a basic level of consumer feedback that they had on their workers and you know some of their skill history on that platform can that you know can we kickstart the 
uh, system with that minimum data. We are creating several very large uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, the NSDC Skill Impact Bond is one where a lot of service providers are actually working with youth, creating the you know skilling them and then placing them in jobs. And you know all of again you know all of that history will get left behind it. We will track whether they got a job or not and overhead. But I think the volume of data which in some of these collaborative initiatives gets created and gets remains underutilized because we don't take it out of there and apply it anywhere is immense. So, so we'd love to explore what are those opportunities where we can link this up. Uh, great. Thank you, Prachi. And uh, I think uh, this aspect of uh, sandboxes as a way of uh, trying to manifest uh, what may ultimately pan out uh, as a, I mean, just to simplify, I mean, uh, initially when I, when I got into technology, I always thought of sandboxes as a rate cut above. And, uh, you know, I would be quite confused that, you know, what has technology got to do with rate cut above? And uh, though, you know, uh, the power of it is amazing. And I think, uh, you know, uh, what you spoke about uh, in that context as uh, how that can lead to many scenarios being envisaged and what can be enabled digitally and hence, uh, then uh, uh, creating quorum around it so that um, it can manifest in its own fashion. Uh, uh, you know, that can be awesome. Now, Gaurav, coming to you, uh, you work a lot with governments. And uh, uh, now, as you look at uh, uh, this from the perspective of wearing, you know, the government hat or some, somebody as a stakeholder from that uh, perspective, how do you see uh, they looking at something like NDL and uh, what can it enable? Because uh, like we heard through uh, the presentations in the morning and uh, Manish Sisodia ji was himself uh, highlighting that uh, uh, when it comes to government, we have to think scale, which is obvious, right? Because governments have the responsibility and they have to make things happen at scale. So how something like this, uh, given uh, the, the the aspects that we've been talking about can enable governments uh, in taking uh, you know in, in moving forward thanks Karam, uh, for this enviable uh, task of demystifying india from a government perspective uh, i've been trying to demystify it for myself for the last 15 months and, uh, i think we made some progress uh, uh, and uh, the thing with india is as a concept it looks outstanding right it all makes sense the challenge comes how do you kind of translate into something tangible that is touchy and feely and you can uh, understand that. And that's the uh, thing. I think Mekin did an outstanding job. In fact, everything that I was thinking or saying is already said. So I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll build on it a little bit and, and maybe uh, add a few things. From a government perspective, I think most of the thinking on India right now, uh, in my understanding, is largely at the government of India level, at the central government level. It's beginning to percolate. Uh, uh, to the states, and I'll give you one example of that. But largely, uh, it's it's at that stage right now. Uh, and let me pick a couple of manifestations of India that that the government is uh, thinking about. There are many of them. Uh, let me pick two. One is something that's been discussed a lot in the last 15-20 minutes. Uh, let me just again repeat that and then kind of build on that. And second, the new one. The first one is the whole thing around trust in the skilling ecosystem. That when I go to a person and claim that this is the skill that I have, how does the other person believe that yes, doesn't have to kind of answer, uh, ask 20 questions and do reference checks and, and all of that, but can really trust what I'm saying. That's the one problem statement that uh, uh, can potentially get solved uh, with India. And there, what everyone was talking about, the concept of verifiable credentials comes into the picture. Classic example, what McKin said is our vaccine certificate. What is the beauty of the vaccine certificate? It's not just that it is digital, that you, you scan and you can get the details. That's not the uh, only part of it. You can actually trace it to the very, uh, you can backward trace it to everything, right? So which hospital did you get vaccinated at? Which nurse kind of vaccine did you get? What, what vaccine did you get? And all of that is also verifiable. So there's a digital signature of the uh, hospital in some sense because it's part of some registry. There's a digital this thing of the person who, did it so it's backward traceable till the T. That's why it has the uh, confidence, and nobody is asking, uh, doubting what they are scanning on your this thing, right? So that's the whole concept, and that's where a couple of building blocks of India and uh, and registries come to the picture. Keeping the technicalities aside, that's the beauty of the vaccine certificate. Now, 
the, the way at least government is thinking is credentials for everything that you've done, right? So you've done a course, there's a uh, verifiable credential for that. You've had some experience in the formal sector, you have a credential for that. You can tomorrow also have an experience in the informal sector and that also can be in some form of a credential and so on. And all of that, now imagine a QR code, somebody scans, you get the history of the person, which you are not doubting. Uh, so that's the potential uh, uh, here. And not just the history, but you're also knowing, okay, this is the proficiency level of the trainer who trained you. This is the rating of the institute where you uh, where you kind of studied. So that's the extension of it. All of that becomes possible as a manifestation of India. Right? Now, again, this is not some Star Wars. Uh, this is uh, at least one instance where it's happening in the scaling ecosystem beginning to happen is, uh, is in UP. Uh, we, we are getting the opportunity to to influence that, shape that a little bit is in the medical education space uh, with nursing and allied uh, medical professionals, paramedics and so on. Uh, there, over the next one year, the idea is to introduce this concept of verifiable credentials for the uh, non-doctor. Everything, everyone in the in the healthcare ecosystem other than a doctor, for that, this is being envisaged. This is currently being done as we speak. Uh, so that's one uh, manifestation. So another uh, uh, manifestation that the government is thinking about is around mobility. So mobility across education and skilling, mobility across government and private, mobility across formal and informal, mobility across geography, right? So so as we know that that individuals move across all of these different streams, right? It's not that uh, you you do skilling, you do some formal education, you do skilling, you work in some formal sector, informal sector, you may go to a different state and so on. Now. There are two NDA principles that become important to allow for seamless mobility. One is again what Nikin talked about, the concept of federated systems. So if I am uh, working in a in a in a company somewhere, tomorrow I'm doing a skilling course, a short-term skilling course, third day I'm getting into a polytechnic and so on, all of them are bound to have their own systems. So government now with this understands it cannot be one monolithic system on which everyone will log in and, and do stuff, right? So there's a concept of federated system theory. But those federated systems have to talk to each other. So that's where the concept of interoperability uh, as an NDA principle comes into the, uh, this thing. So this federated architecture and this interoperability, that will enable all of them to talk to each other. And now what does that require? That requires what Gaurav was saying in terms of uh, uh, Gmail and, and, and different email services at the time protocols, that requires standards. Right? So everything everything will talk to each other when they comply to certain standards. Now that beginning has already been made, is being made. Uh, so just two couple of examples of that. Uh, one is what's happening in higher education uh, as let's say ABC, Academic Bank of Credits. Right Now that's where what is being decided is how many hours of what training you get to get a certain number of credits in that uh, particular proficiency. So that beginning is being made, I would say when the government is thinking about academic bank of credits and that's starting off with the higher education arena. Skilling, we know that uh, uh, NSDC has done a very good job over the years to define qualification packs, to define that. That that be can become that common language to which in any case already in the skilling ecosystem everybody is doing. So these standards will become extremely critical to make this interoperability happen, uh, which will then allow for mobility, seamless mobility and imagine it like uh, log in with Google, right? Today you don't just log in with Google on Google things. You can go anywhere and, and everywhere. Just most of the places you'll see an option of login with Google, right? Similarly, uh, a person will be able to use the same maybe ID generated at different places because these systems are talking to each other. That's a not a full, I would say, best example, but but an example of how this can play out. So mobility is 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 one uh, verifiable credentials <coughs> is is another and there are many many other dimensions. Uh, 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 this another thing the government has in mind uh, again not going into details but it's the whole second order effects of all of this and the second order effect is things like what what is being called IKS Indian Knowledge Systems right why can't a, a person who's worked in a setup in Banaras to make sarees for five years why is that not counted as a as a formal, as a skill which is verifiable, which is part of the resume of the person uh, and so on. So all of these localization, right? Localization in Indian knowledge systems, in languages, 
all of that would get enabled over a period of time. That may look like Star Wars today, but it, it will happen in the coming years. Uh, uh, but yeah, the basic things is what, what uh, the verifiable credentials, I think, is the most tangible example of that. I don't know if it helps you, but yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing that out, Gaurav. In fact, uh, I heard everyone speak about uh, uh, the importance of trust, the importance of uh, verifiable credentials uh, being uh, something uh, you know that that's really needed to kind of create that interoperability, if you will, uh, uh, in terms of what happens. So, Mikin, coming back to you, uh, looking at uh, you know your experience uh, working in the private sector now, also in the social sector. Now, of course, by virtue of that, also working uh, uh, with the governments per se. What do you think are some of the challenges uh, based on the experiences that you have seen that kind of uh, you know touch upon uh, this as an aspect? Yeah, I think uh, Prachi hinted at this. The first and largest challenge is that uh, a lot of the technology companies make money out of data. Right. So, all that saying of data is the new oil. Uh, so, most internet technology companies make money out of data. I think the first challenge to think about is that, hey, why would that data or why would a private technology company be willing to share that data or put it in a public platform? Right. Uh, and if, if I were to think about this as an urban company investor, I would not recommend it. Right. This is... This is what they have built over the years. Uh, it's hard earned. and But I think this is where, uh, if I were to take a social hat and think about hey, what's right uh, from a citizen point of view, from a Samaj point of view, it might be worthwhile to start pondering on questions on data rights. right? So who owns the data of the beautician? who works at urban company, uh, is it urban company alone or is it co-owned between the beautician and urban company? And does she have a method of being able to export that data out of urban company and upload that data somewhere else? Right? That hey, is there interoperability allowed? Just like government had to intervene for mobile number portability that otherwise Airtel doesn't want you to go. Right, uh, and they will make make it very very hard. And your mobile number is something that lives that lives with so many people. So they don't want. It's not easy for you to change numbers. Uh, similarly, I feel on this front, especially on data, you would have to think about things like data rights and privacy uh, to figure out hey, who owns this data. My personal view is that again, user first or citizen first systems uh, would hold us in good stead and private companies being able to make money and use them as long as they are customers of those. I think um, another key piece that both society and uh, government can do a better job of is having aspirations and standards that are global in nature. Uh, right? And I will probably move away from India a little bit to talk about in my view, the two areas where India has done a fantastic job of skilling are IT and nursing. Right? We are exporter of talent in both of these uh, and in general, overall, uh, like large amount of money comes into the country as a result of being able to export the capacity of these two talents. And I think a lot of that has happened because uh, in both of these spaces, we meet global needs and hence stand by global standards. Today, when I think about hey, how our electrician training happens or how our fridge repair training happens, I don't think it stands to German standards. Uh, right? And I think it's important that it does, that the electrician here is aspiring to work in German companies and has the opportunity to be able to work in German companies, whether in Germany or here. Uh, but that access to that kind of opportunity and that kind of goals being there, I feel is a is a role that both private sector but possibly more society and government uh, would have to play a little bit of. Uh, it was IT entrepreneurs in the case of IT. In nursing, it's been a combination of government and uh, entrepreneurs. And I feel like either of these could work in different skilling spaces. Great. That's uh, very useful. In fact, a key thread I've picked up here was uh, the aspect of aspirations. 
right? So the and I think again going back to what Manishi was saying in the morning, it's the aspirations of not just the people but also of uh, the people who run uh, these organizations, including the government uh, sector organizations. So how can that uh, come out? So in that context, uh, Gayatri ji wanted to uh, ask you about uh, especially putting a women-centric lens on this, right? Because I think uh, 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 that's an area which is important and needs to be addressed. So, so if you look at it from that perspective, what does it uh, what does it mean? How should we look at it? If we go back to the point I was making in the beginning, is uh, compared to the past, I think access to digital in both urban and rural is available in some form. Individual access is not available. For example, I was just thinking as everybody was talking, assuming uh, I am a beautician in a, in a village, I may not have a device which is mine alone. Uh, and that I think is a problem. And I'm, I'm sort of being open about which device it is, whether it's a mobile or it's a, it's a computer is, is a question. But uh, a device to a person may not be the availability. So I think uh, women are therefore even more disadvantaged. So the pecking order is the man in the family, the child is in school, and then the woman. That is the pecking order. Uh, and if that is the pecking order, I think we need to see how access is first uh, available. The second, I think, um, see, I'm no technologist, but I can tell you uh, clearly what what is what is there is we are not at least in stealing, and I would extend this to education, right? We are only able to assess paper. So I think the challenge is not one is verifiable certificate. I mean, that's evidently we have, uh, you know, we told to be of the worst order. But assuming that is available, even then we actually do not have a great assessment skill sets. The standards to which we have to assess, I think that that whole body of work is weak. And uh, it's an interesting thing. What is happening today is in the interest of digital infrastructure for report cards, uh, it's we have increased the number of assessments. So in schools, for example, August 5th every day in many of the states has become a assessment day. Your admission stops in July 31st, assessment in August 5th. Meaningless. Month after month. Earlier it was three times a year, two times a year, three times a year. Now it is month after month. So I think some of these practical issues, we need to take it off for platforms like this to actually function efficiently. Even before we take private data, see, uh, to me, an urban company data or an astral pipe data is a small microcosm of the data. The government data is not interoperable. So the skill certificate is standing outside the education certificate. They're two separate certificates, it's not working together. And spoken English certificate will be the third. Moral science is the fourth. So even if we are able to, and it's called by various names, I think uh, in some states, welcome, home, happy, whatever, whatever, okay. But fundamentally, if you look at it, it's the same. And I think that's where we need to see first within the state system, because if public system is the major system, state systems, how do we integrate it to have readability, uh, seamless readability? Uh, uh, within a state and then intra, you know, within the country. Mobility, I think, borrowing from making uh, mobility of that certificate when I am mobile. I just want to make one last point is, uh, we can actually, if you look at where remittances came, it's the Middle East. And it is construction, it's neither IT nor nursing, right? It is purely construction and teachers. So they made on, uh, and two countries, other than Middle East, they went to Malaysia. These were the literally two countries in which remittance and remittance is going to fall there. Right? How did they take our, our credentials? Maybe it was in the black or grey market. But there was some reason they were able to do it. I think it may be worth seeing. I, I, I feel we need to look at our uh, way of credentialing and what urban company did for beauticians and plumbers to send. Can we bring it into the into the state system through NDA. 
because today's state system is stuck with the digital certificate you know the verification of a certificate which does not assess skill set is the one thank you for bringing that out in fact uh, very relevant that you know it's access it's mobility it's digitization it's a uh, sharing of uh, you know a few common things in that context which is important so prachi uh, uh, question in that context uh, when it comes to looking at uh, you know uh, you fund individual companies right but what about funding networks uh, which can hence look at create co creating or co leveraging some of these common digital public goods and hence accelerate their own journey in that context um so i think both go hand in hand gorav i think uh, there is a role uh, and you know almost uh, all organizations like us want to see some here and now tangible impact um and it is not just because we want to see it i think that's what informs a lot of the work that we can do at an ecosystem level or at a network level so i don't at all think it's an either or choice there is a uh, so you know we've done extensive work with the government and you know gorav and some other have been huge partners in that so um so you know like there is there is this work which is happening at the level of the state government some at the central level also which is unleashing a lot of impact for those states and is also informing work that other states can do but i think it's very much grounded in what we had learned several years working with individual not for profits uh, organizations like labor neta partner companies which actually taught us what is it that the kids need what is it that the youth need what are their aspirations what are the models that work or they don't work so um, so i think both need to happen together and yet i think there's no denying that uh, the network effects when they get unleashed you know you, it's it's just the scale that you can achieve and the some of some of the impact that you see actually you couldn't have imagined also at that time right so so if i look at whatsapp i don't think if anyone would have come to uh, a social funder for funding whatsapp we would have at all looked at it and said that you know this is this will become like the single power, most powerful not just communication tool for business tool for millions of micro entrepreneurs in india right so so funders don't have the vision entrepreneurs have the vision um and but at least i think uh, they have the sense that you know this also needs to be funded and um, this also needs to be uh, you know this this has a role to play um, very similar thing is like you know just like in the vc parlance you look at the hockey stick of you know those two three big bets you will take which will uh, you know return Uh, super super novel returns to you i think it's very true for all the social innovation also right if you look at the rcts which have been done in the social sector they will be you know the, you know the amount of time money etc that but the ones which have gotten scaled you know they will be in millions like the deworming rct which has been done will be in millions so i think the network effect is uh, is definitely something that all of us invest in want to invest more in and fully realizing the the power that they have and but it's not an either or of you know not doing the here and now uh, i think thank you very well said uh, prachi i think the network effect and how it enables everyone uh, and pretty much every for everyone to take off uh, from where they are i uh, got a, a one final question we have run out of time so uh, a quick you are an entrepreneur yourself right and uh, especially when you look at this space uh, and all the discussion that happens around this uh, prachi uh, just spoke about the fact that it is the entrepreneurs who have the vision who take the thing forward uh, what do you think are let's say two or three things if they were to come about in this context can actually help uh, entrepreneurs to really uh, move on to the next level in this context a very broad question uh, i think one is a set of building blocks uh, that need to be in place right where like you said credentials type of in place the histories are in place already right communication come in place so a set of building blocks which entrepreneurs and and startups can leverage uh, uh to kind of quickly build solutions which will adhere to the indian principles and therefore will be interop so i think one is that and work is happening on that front uh, uh pretty well i think second is uh, uh what is currently less and missing which needs to happen more is also reference solutions and which is again part of the india architecture but reference solutions that actually use all of this to create something which is open source which is a digital public good that people can leverage to the extent they want with appropriate flexibility and so on i think that we need, what we need to see will be good to see is more and more of reference solutions coming in 
so that everyone is not reinventing the wheel. Uh, uh, and even when I look from a government perspective, reference solutions. So every government is not making the same thing. Every state ends up building the same kind of technology for solving the same problems, and and lot of money down the drain. A uh, uh, lot of time wasted and so on. So it will increase both the speed to time to market or time to launch, uh, uh, and also the quality of what is there will be much much higher, and it will it will be interoperable uh, with what other states are doing. I think reference solutions is the main thing that I would. Say. Uh, so we have run out of time. So thank you so much uh, to all the panelists and uh, for to all of you uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gaurav. Thank you, panelists.